even if a policymaker wanted to understand the prevalence of depression and identify the elders who are depressed in order to target for policy, it would be very hard for them to do that. Welcome to Vox Dev Talks. My name is Tim Phillips. In high-income countries, there's a renewed focus on mental health and well-being, particularly for the elderly. But elsewhere in the world, we know comparatively little about how well the elderly cope with problems like depression and loneliness. And there are few policies to support those who are suffering. A new essay in the Journal of Economic Perspectives fills some of these gaps and suggests ways in which further research and policies can help close this gap in our knowledge. Maddie McElway of Dartmouth College and Garima Sharma of MIT are two of the authors. They're both here now. Welcome to Vox Talks, Maddie. Thank you so much for having me. And Garima, welcome as well. Thank you. Hi, Tim. Maddie, obvious question to start with. Why don't we know more about the mental health and the well-being of the elderly in low and middle income countries? Well, traditionally, neither old age nor mental health have been a focus of research and policy. In poor countries, populations tend to skew younger, so there tends to be little focus on the elderly in those countries. Generally, mental health tends to be overlooked in poorer countries, so therefore the intersection of these two topics is especially lacking attention. And I did say there are relatively few policies to support them. Is this because we don't know very much about the problem? Yes, it is an important reason. So in the Global Burden of Disease database, only 3% of studies that measure the prevalence of depression across developing countries do so for the elderly population. So even if a policymaker wanted to understand the prevalence of depression and identify the elders who are depressed in order to target for policy, it would be very hard for them to do that. But the good news is that there's a growing set of studies that is modeled off of the health and retirement study in the U.S. that are measuring the prevalence of depression, but also of other health ailments that plague the elderly across many developing countries, including in Mexico, China, as well as our own work in Tamil Nadu. Tell me about these studies, because so much of the way we diagnose illnesses like depression depends on people describing their emotions and their feelings. So can the surveys that are used for this purpose, can they gather reliable statistics on mental health? And can we compare those statistics across cultures? Yes, they can. Oh, good. So the gold standard for measuring depression is face-to-face -face interviews with a psychiatrist who's then going to diagnose whether someone is clinically depressed. Mm -hmm. It turns out that even very short surveys are able to capture these diagnoses quite well. So for example, the CESD is a 10-question survey that's been validated to successfully diagnose depression among the elderly population. It asks them questions like, did you feel that everything you did was an effort? Did you feel hopeful about the future? Did you enjoy your life? And so on. Mm -hmm. And these questions capture depression among the elderly population quite well. There is another survey, which is called the PHQ-9, which is a nine-question survey, which measures depression not among the elderly population, but among other populations, which also asks about physical symptoms. So, for example, was it hard for you to fall asleep? Of course, this doesn't capture depression very well among the elderly population, but it does. These physical symptoms are a good indicator of depression among other populations of people. So, yes, surveys do a very good job, and because they are short and uh, the same set of questions, they successfully diagnose depression across several contexts. So for this paper, you look for the available data that we have on depression amongst the elderly in low-middle income countries. How hard was that data to find? Not as hard as you would think, actually. Good. Thanks in part to recent data collection initiatives. So for decades, there's been this panel survey in the U.S. called the Health and Retirement Study that's gathered longitudinal data on aging. And this survey has since become the template for a growing network of longitudinal aging studies around the world, which have been referred to as the Health and Retirement Family of Surveys. So we took data from this family of surveys from six low and middle income countries. So Brazil, China, Costa Rica, 
India, Mexico, and South Africa. We also use data from a similar panel that we're conducting in Tamil Nadu, India. And we wanted to get a little bit more data on Africa in particular, given we didn't have that many countries from the region. So we also used a panel data set from Malawi that followed a similar template as the health and retirement family. But we should mm -hmm. say that these panel studies are relatively recent. Most of these studies in developing countries started in the last 10 years, and they still leave a lot of the developing world uncovered. And in this data, how common is depression in the elderly? Rates of elderly depression tend to be quite high in developing countries and higher than in the U.S., in study data from the U.S., it looks like around 10 to 20 percent of elderly are depressed, depending on which gender and which age group you look at. But in the other data sets, it's around 25 to 40 percent. I remember being taught there's a U-shaped curve for well-being. Younger people have higher well-being. It dips in middle age, recovers later in life. That was for high-income countries. Is the same true for low-middle-income countries? Our results suggest something different. We find an alarming pattern of increasing depression with age. So as people oh. get older in low- and middle-income countries, they become depressed at higher rates. Other research, as you've described, finds this inverted U-shape where there's a midlife crisis that occurs around age 50 and well-being improves afterwards. But in low-income countries in particular, so India, Mexico and China, we find that depression is rising in age among the elderly. We can only speculate as to why this is compared to the U.S., so one potential reason is that there's better social insurance in developed countries where people are able to save for retirement or have pensions. And a second possibility is that healthcare is better in the developed world. And so people are less likely to suffer from depression as they are getting older. Both of these things are worse in developing countries, which is why depression could get worse as people age. Now, also in the data that you have, are men and women suffering from depression equally? No. Tragically, we find that across all age groups and in all countries, the women suffer more than the men. Oh. For example, among 70 to 80 year olds in India, 35% of men are depressed compared to 41% of women. And actually, these gaps by gender emerge when people are 55 years old and persist throughout old age. So tragically, we find that women are more depressed than men. These are extraordinary high numbers, aren't they? And also, let's think about physical health. Is poor mental health linked to poor physical health to increased risk of mortality? Yes. So these are some of our most striking results. We look first at ADLs or activities of daily living. These are, you know, exactly what they sound like. How easy is it for you to do basic activities of day-to-day -day life? This is one of the key measures of physical well-being among the elderly. And we find a very strong relationship between elders' ability to perform various activities of daily living and their depression. And then perhaps even more striking, we find that depression is a predictor of death. Uh -huh. So as you remember, some of these studies are panel studies. So we use data from one wave of the survey and we measure depression that way. And then we say two years later, are the people who were depressed more likely to have died? And the answer appears to be yes. And this is a really striking result we find. Now, as you mentioned before, you did further research in Tamil Nadu in India. What else did you want to find out from this? The purpose of this research was twofold. Mm -hmm. One is, as Maddie described at the beginning, panel data on the elderly is extremely rare. And so we don't know how it is that their lives evolve. So we wanted to collect this panel data over time to see how the lives of the elderly are evolving. And in particular, JPAL, which is a Jameel Poverty Action Lab, runs randomized control trials to evaluate the effectiveness of various policies. So we wanted the data set to serve as a platform where in the background, researchers would run these randomized control trials to evaluate policies, and the data would help us track outcomes over time. So that was the first purpose, to evaluate randomized control trials. And the second was, we wanted to understand more deeply the lives of the elders who are living alone. Mm. Because although in developing countries, we expect elders to live with their children, a surprising number of these elders are now living all by themselves. They probably face problems that are unique to them, but because they are still a small share of the population, we don't know that much about them. This population is only slated to grow given the demographic transition that's happening in these countries as children move away and people are having fewer children. 
So we wanted to oversample this population in order to better understand the challenges that they face and potential remedies. My assumption, and I imagine many other people's assumptions, is that in the countries for which you have data, the social norm is for elderly people to live with their families. Am I wrong in assuming this? No, this is a great question. This is exactly what we had anticipated as well, mm. that in developing countries, exactly because of what you describe, that people are living with their children, that they will be less likely to be alone. Mm -hmm. But actually, what we ended up finding is that the prevalence of loneliness in these countries is comparable to that in the US. Wow. About 10 to 30 percent of elders report being alone. As I said, in Tamil Nadu, 9% of elders are living entirely alone and their reported rates of loneliness are much higher. So 60% of them report feeling alone. And as Maddie said, this loneliness also manifests or translates into depression and lower rates of functional ability and higher rates of mortality among these populations. So not only are these elders living entirely alone, but they're also suffering in terms of limited functional ability and higher mortality. So elderly people who are living alone, they are more likely to be depressed, are they, compared to those who are living with their families? Yes, absolutely. People who are living alone, tragically around 55% of them seem likely to be depressed. And this is in contrast to elders living in any other sort of living arrangement where you see 30 to 40 percent are depressed. And of course, we can't talk about this without talking about the influence of poverty. How closely linked are poverty and depression? So in our Tamil Nadu sample, we find they're quite linked. So yeah. we, we split the sample into quintiles based on daily per capita household expenditure. And we find that rates of depression fall steeply with expenditure. So to put some numbers on it, you find that nearly 50% of elderly in the poorest quintile are depressed versus 27% in the highest. Now, we might make some assumptions about what is causing what, but I notice you've been quite careful in the way that you're expressing this to talk about how rates of depression and other factors that we're talking about are associated. Can we make a causal link from depression to these other factors? Right now, we can't really say very much causal. Yeah. We see some very strong correlations. And many of our correlations that we present in the paper do control for some key omitted variables like age or gender. But we certainly do not want to say that these are necessarily causal relations. There could be. So, for instance, for the really strong, shocking results in mortality, for instance, you could imagine the causality could go in either direction. So, you know, maybe it could be that depression causes mortality where, you know, you feel depressed, you withdraw from day to day life and that leads your physical health to decline. But you could also imagine you get a life threatening diagnosis and that is what is causing the mental illness. So there is some evidence of causal links from elderly populations in the U.S. and from non-elderly populations in developing countries that would suggest that some of these relationships are causal. But overall, there's very little causal evidence on the elderly in poor countries. We have just such an astonishingly high rate of depression that policy really should be doing something about it if we could do something about it. So let's talk about that a little bit. First of all, if poverty, if that is linked to depression, well, we want to relieve poverty anyway. Maybe higher pension payments or more financial support for the elderly may help. Do we know if this would be effective in relieving depression? Among non-elderly populations, so among adults, mm -hmm. cash transfers are found to improve their mental health. And it's then natural to expect cash transfers, like in the form of pensions, to also help the elderly because the elderly are particularly financially constrained relative to other adult populations. And pensions are an increasingly common tool that countries have adopted in order to improve social protection among the elderly population. So there is experimental as well as non-experimental evidence that suggests that pensions improve mental health among the elderly. For example, there was a pension experiment in Paraguay that finds this result. In our own preliminary results in India, though, we don't find a causal effect of old age pensions on depression, but these are oh. preliminary results. So although there's some evidence, we think that there's a lot more work that's needed on the amount of the pension, the frequency of the pension, and whether pension when coupled with therapy can be effective in alleviating 
depression among the elderly population. In wealthy countries, therapy is a well-known, reasonably common, effective treatment for depression, but it's expensive. It takes a long time. It takes a lot of commitment. Is there perhaps a more cost-effective alternative equivalent to therapy that could be implemented widely in low-middle-income countries? It seems, yes, there are more cost-effective versions of therapies that can work. In addition to the cost of therapy, another core issue in developing countries is just a lack of trained mental health professionals. Mm -hmm. So these more cost-effective approaches have typically been, let's simplify the content of the therapy so that it's something that can be administered by a layperson. And they've often found to be effective in various populations in developing countries. There is even a small-scale study of this sort of intervention among elderly in India, which found it to be effective. There can still be a trade-off between scale and efficacy. So in our sample of elderly living alone in Tamil Nadu, we tried something even cheaper, which was therapy delivered by lay people, but delivered over the phone. So it was a very scalable relatively low cost, but unfortunately it didn't do much. Oh. Um, and we compare it to a, a thousand rupee cash transfer that was actually less costly than the therapy and seemed to do a little bit more. Right. Okay. Now we also have a treatment for loneliness and that is improving the social connections of lonely people. It seems obvious, but it's not easy to do, isn't it? Can policy do anything to help the elderly keep, maintain, improve their social connections? Yes. So the good news is that social connections help in alleviating depression among the elderly population. There are many randomized control trials of cognitive behavioral therapy, which Mary described across various places, where interaction with even a layperson therapist alleviates depression and improves functional ability among the elderly population. But the good news is that the CBT seems to work regardless of sort of what the format is, suggesting that the social connection aspect of it is actually quite important in alleviating depression. There are other programs that the government could run to improve social connections. So, for example, the Tamil Nadu government that we've been working with is starting a new program where community health workers visit the elderly in their home to deliver medication to them and potentially also therapy. And this is going to improve social connection because there's someone who's showing up at your door to talk to you and interact with you. Therapy by itself could also organically generate social connections mm -hmm. because when you have a better state of mind, then you're more likely to seek those connections yourself. And of course, there are other things that the government could do, for example, organizing group activities among the elderly or giving them a sense of purpose, for example, babysitting the local children in the community and so on. So there are many potential interventions that could improve social connections, and we think that they will be promising to try out. Uh, in every country in the world, no matter what its state of economic development, the challenge of providing health care to the elderly in general is something that policymakers are struggling to meet. This mental health crisis that we're seeing is really all underpinned by this challenge of providing health care. Absolutely. And I think one interesting remark to make on this is this potential bi-directional relationship between physical and mental health. Yeah. Because you could imagine that, well, providing more health care could improve physical health and that could have effects on mental health. There could also, of course, part of health care would be providing mental health, which would hopefully have effects on, on mental health. Sure. But there's an interesting reverse direction, which is there are reasons to think that mental health influences physical health. So for instance, depression might lead elders to withdraw from their day-to-day -day lives and that could accelerate their physical decline. Or put differently, if you if you could somehow improve mental health first, that might get people to take up health care and want to go to the doctor and seek preventative treatments, et cetera. We started with this by saying that there, we really don't know enough about this. There hasn't been enough research. So if someone is a researcher and they think this is an interesting topic and they would wanted to get involved with that to do some research, where should they be directing their energy? So there are many places. One is, as we described, loneliness is a challenge that is increasingly plaguing the elderly in developing countries. So thinking of interventions to alleviate loneliness among this population, for example, group activities or group therapy would be one. A second is we also describe the health challenges that are facing this elderly population. And something that we find in our Tamil Nadu data, for example, is that the elderly are suffering from diseases that are underdiagnosed. So they have the disease, but they don't know that they have the disease. Ah, so yeah. interventions that help diagnose diseases and then treat them, for example, by delivering health at the doorstep, would be another interesting set of policy interventions to try. 
we describe the population of elders living alone, which is 9% of elders. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that a vast majority of them, so over 80% are women who are widowed, who live by themselves. Ah. And something that they cite as a reason for living by themselves is that they have these interpersonal constraints with members of their family, with their daughters-in-law and so on. So interventions that tackle these interpersonal constraints would be potentially another avenue to try out, which would be new both academically, but also important potentially from a policy perspective. Totally agree with everything Garima said. In addition, there's a lot left to learn on pensions. So more randomized evaluations of the effects of old age pensions could be really helpful. There's some evidence on the delivery of therapy by lay people to elderly populations. But I think more evidence there could be really helpful, along with evidence of how you could get those effects to persist and be cost effective. So for instance, if they could somehow be wrapped into ongoing government programs, that could both help with persistence and cost effectiveness. We implicitly know, and your research makes it clear that these are serious problems that affect hundreds of millions of people that are alive today and will continue to do that if we do not do more to treat depression in the elderly. What are the potential consequences if we don't face up to this challenge? There are really two answers here. First is that aside from anything causal you want to say, depression is a problem in itself. There are huge welfare implications of having a large number of elderly in the population suffering from depression because mental health is such a core part of happiness. This toll could increase as the demographic transition is going to increase the fraction of elderly living in developing countries. The second answer is that given all these correlations and potential causal relationships we've just discussed, depression could have negative effects on other outcomes. Things like physical health or poverty, and these outcomes have their own implications for welfare. Maddie, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And Garama, thank you as well. Thanks so much, Tim. The paper's called Depression and Loneliness Among the Elderly in Low- and Middle-Income Countries. And a big long list of authors here. You might have heard of some of them. Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo, Erin Grela, Maddie McElway, Frank Schilbach, Garama Sharma and Garija Vajinathan. It is published in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, Volume 37, Number 2. This has been a Vox Dev Talk. The best way to make sure you don't miss an episode is to subscribe on your podcast platform. And if you like what you hear, tell your colleagues about it, and then they get to hear the episodes as well. Our past episodes, as always, are at voxdev.org. <laughs>